in a week where Cameroon's opposition leader was charged with insurrection and hostility towards his homeland and where Uganda seeks to begin oil production in 2022, the continent has been robust with happenings that have political and social economic implications. This is Africa Focus. Here is a pick into the stories set for today. Searching for black gold, Angola launches its largest ever investment in offshore oil and gas exploration. The Ugandan government clamps down on illegal fishing on its territorial waters. A South African sculpture waxes lyrical about an African Madame to Tussauds. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our sign language interpreter today is Monica Mwangi. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. The People's Democratic Party PDP presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar promised to revive Nigeria's economy at Arali in the commercial capital of Lagos. The businessman and former vice president has said that he would boost oil sector investments, cut costly fuel subsidies, and double the size of the economy by 2025 if he wins the presidential election. 72-year-old Abu Bakr leads the party that inherited power from the military in 1999 and went on to govern for the next 16 years. For the first eight of those years, Atiku served as vice president to Nigeria's new democratic leader and former military head of state, Olesegun Obasanjo. Atiku sought the APC All Progressive Congress presidential ticket for the 2015 election but lost to incumbent President Muhammadu Buhari and eventually threw his support behind him, funding the new president's campaign and even lending him a private jet. But Atiku switched sides again in 2017 and last year emerged as the PDP's candidate. He has promised to make Nigeria work again, lifting the country out of economic doldrums with business-friendly policies that he says will create jobs. Several small businesses were closed and some struggled to attract customers in larger parts of Johannesburg on Tuesday after South Africa's power utility ESCOM implemented major electricity cuts for a third straight day. The power cuts have prompted frustration among ordinary South Africans and shop workers, many of whom do not have access to backup power sources like diesel generators. The cash-strapped utility said it would cut 3,000 megawatts of power from the national grid from 0600 GMT on Tuesday, likely until 2100 GMT, a day after cutting 4,000 megawatts in the worst power cut seen in several years. Around a third of ESCOM's 45,000 megawatt capacity is offline. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa says he is working to reform ESCOM, which supplies more than 90% of the power in Africa's most industrialized economies, but is drowning in more than $30 billion of debt to lift the economy before an election in May. The 32nd summit of the African Union commenced this week with security, solidarity and forced displacement, all forming key points of discussion. At the meeting, members elected Egypt's president Abel Fattah al-Sisi as chairperson of the union, marking the end of Rwandan president Paul Kagame one-year tenure in the bloc agenda-setting role. Chair of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki, used this time on the podium to highlight efforts in the fight against terrorism across the Sahel and Lake Chad Basin region. He said that despite current efforts, security remained a serious concern and would require a new surge of solidarity to resolve. The African Union dubbed 2019 the year of refugees, returnees and internally displaced persons and the issue of forced displacement is likely to remain a central theme at the two-day summit. Speaking at the opening session, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that African countries host one-third of the world's refugees and internally displaced persons and thanked the continent's leaders for opening their borders to those fleeing conflicts in their home countries. 
A pro-government campaigner was killed in eastern Senegal on Monday in the first fatality from the string of pre-election clashes between supporters of President Macky Sall and the opposition. A police official told journalists that the individual was stabbed during scuffles between the Unity and Assembly Party, PUR, which is led by opposition leader Issa Sal and pro-government campaigners. A police source said a motorcyclist was killed by a vehicle speeding away from the scene of the stabbing. A journalist association, meanwhile, said eight reporters were also injured in the violence. President Sal told an election meeting that the stabbing victim was a member of his governing Senegalese Democratic Party and called for light to be shed on the killing so that the election campaign does not become a pretext for violence. Violence has buffeted Senegal ahead of presidential elections on February 24th, despite appeals for calm from religious leaders. As Angola launches its largest ever investment in offshore oil and gas exploration, we meet the men and women behind the huge project. Moored in the endless South Atlantic Ocean far off the coast of Angola, the Kaombo Norte oil extraction vessel is a deeply impressive sight. 330 meters long with a tower 110 meters high, sending burning flames into the sky. But inside, daily life on the ship is a different matter. With a crew of about 100 sharing narrow passages and confined spaces, leaving for weeks at a stretch in close quarters 24-7. This is Kaumbu North, a state-of-the-art oil extraction vessel anchored in the South Atlantic Ocean, 250 kilometers off Angola. It's part of the country's biggest ever push into offshore oil and gas exploration. At 330 meters in length and 110 meters at its highest point, this enormous moored boat is an impressive sight. But for those on board, personal space is hard to come by. This is uh, my home. So right now we have a lot of people on board due to the startup phase. So we are occupying most of the beds. So it's, it's narrow, but it's uh, quite uh, cozy and new. So it's, uh, it's, it's enough, I would say. The cooks and cleaning staff are the unsung heroes of the roughly 100 people on board the ship, owned by French oil company Total. With 23 different nationalities and various dietary requirements, the kitchen has its hands full. We, we work a lot here. Yeah? We have too much pressure, uh, but always is a challenge and we, we love that challenge. I love that challenge to satisfy all the guys on board. Yeah. Despite working in a dangerous environment seven days a week, away from their families for a month at a time, some really enjoy it. You miss most of the main dates or the family, the birthdays and everything else. But uh, it gives us some freedom when you're at home. You have 28 days that we are free to choose what we're going to do, if you want to rest, want to travel. As for women on board, there are only a handful. I'm uh, giving this message to all my colleagues because they were thinking oh, maybe the uh, offshore environment is not women friendly and so on. But I'm here and I'm really happy to be here. Working offshore might not be for everyone, but for some, it's the best job in the world. Ugandan Marine Forces have arrested over 400 illegal Congolese fishermen in Lake Edward. Kampala has stepped up patrols in recent months to crack down on illegal fishing on Lakes Edward and Albert, straddling Uganda and Congo. The lakes are home to catfish, tilapia and Nile parch, which are consumed locally and exported. The missions have resulted in tensions soaring between the two countries. Landlocked Uganda's fishing industry accounts for 3% of the country's GDP and employs well over half a million people. As these two Congolese fishermen try to get their catch of the day, they too find themselves caught. With no choice but to surrender to these Ugandan Marines, the pair is taken ashore and handed over to police. They are the latest to be detained in a Ugandan clampdown on illegal fishing, which has led to the arrest of over 400 Congolese fishermen. I couldn't get any fish in our side. That's why I crossed over to Uganda. 
What can I say? They had arrested me, and I do not know how my kids will survive. The Democratic Republic of Congo owns three quarters of Lake Edward, but uncontrolled fishing in the country's lawless east has depleted stocks and its fishermen venture increasingly into Ugandan waters. Kampala's crackdown on the illegal fishing has sent tensions between the two countries soaring, especially since President Yoweri Museveni launched the Marines unit. After seeing that there was a, the trend of illegal fishing had gone high, and he, he decided to protect the resource, which would help the government in terms of revenue and the, the, boost the economy and the standards of living of fishermen and the communities around. The fishing industry contributes 3% to Uganda's gross domestic product and employs over 700,000 people, and competition for fish is high in the lake waters. Much of our area is the key breeding area. Our waters are shallow, their waters are deep. So most of the fish is from this end of this lake. And when it is peak fishing, you get a lot of influx of Congolese boats coming on our side, and which is a very big challenge. With so many livelihoods dependent on fishing, the stakes are high. In July, armed forces from Uganda and the DRC clashed on Lake Edward, leaving two Ugandan soldiers and three civilians dead. Nigeria is currently a large untapped market for breweries, but with a population expected to grow to 410 million by 2050, many international brewing companies are eyeing up the vast potential of the Nigerian market. Gigantic billboards advertising beer now dominate the skyline of Nigeria's megacity, Lagos, signaling the escalating battle between multinational brewers for drinkers in Africa's most populous country. Relaxing with a beer after work, a scene repeated across the globe, but somewhat rarer in Nigeria, where people consume just nine litres of beer on average per year. But could that be changing? When the ball is being played, we watch and we drink a lot. Most especially when your, when your club is playing. Rather than spend three odd hours in traffic, I can spend time drinking beer here. The wear and tear, the bumpy ride, you know, avoid that, basically. International brewers are pouring investment into Nigeria, hoping to capture a share of what is still a relatively untapped market. One Belgian company has opened a new factory on the outskirts of Lagos, the largest in Western Africa. Lagos is the big pain. Lagos is 25 million. If you look at Lagos in, 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 in Africa, Lagos is about the fourth or fifth biggest economy in, in, in Africa. So if you want to play big, then you have to be in Lagos. For now, more well-established Nigerian brewers are still the industry leaders. They are confident they can stay on top and view the arrival of international competition as a positive testament to the country's growing appeal. We see it as a fair game between competition, as in competitors. Um, we have been in this market a long time. We are, uh, we are both 60% market share in this country. We know the country, we know the terrain. Um, there is a lot of room for growth in this market. Uh, there is a lot of room to excite the consumers more. Brewers are betting on attracting the younger generation, and with half of Nigeria's 190 million people under the age of 30, and the country's total population expected to double by 2050, it's easy to see why brewers are hopping into the market. Coming up right after the break. Senegal Silicon Valley, we talk to budding entrepreneurs seeking investors in Senegal. Welcome back. Our sign language interpreter today is Monica Mwangi, and this is Africa Focus. 
Now, in Senegal, young entrepreneurs are teeming with ideas, but investors remain cautious, especially when it comes to funding tech startups. But this could be a thing starting to change. Due to a shortage of jobs in Senegal, many people are forced to fend for themselves so as to generate their own income. The country's unemployment rate is estimated at 16%. These young Senegalese entrepreneurs have three minutes to deliver their pitch. They're taking part in a global competition to win funding to develop their startup ideas. Olivia Ndiaye's business got going less than two years ago. We quickly got all the right people in place, quickly found an incubator to help us to structure the project. But unfortunately, it's more the financial side, the investors, funding, especially in the early stages. That's where you find difficulties. The relative novelty of tech startups adds to the cautious attitude of investors in a country where financial resources are limited. Swiss investment fund Seedstars has a presence in 80 developing countries, including Senegal and other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. What's lacking is investment in smaller scale projects for startups that need between around $10,000 to $50,000. The private investor scene doesn't really exist today, or at least it needs a lot of development. That's one of the main things that Seedstars will do by looking for early stage startups that often have a great need for funding today. Yet things are getting going at a local level as well. CTIC, a business incubator started in Dakar in 2011, recently organized a regional investors summit. And the Senegalese state has also taken measures to boost entrepreneurship. For some years now, Senegal has lowered the minimum social capital necessary to start a business from 1 million CFA francs to 100,000 CFA francs. You can have a social capital of 100,000 CFA francs. I think that really facilitates the creation of limited liability companies and their single owner equivalents. Authorities are also planning to open a digital technology park in 2021 to further galvanize this sector. With these changes to Senegal's business environment, other young investors like Olivia may soon be able to get their business ideas up and running. 30-year-old Lungelo Gumede is one of Durban's favorite sons and one of the best sculptors on the African continent. Gumede has always had an artistic hand. At school, he often drew pictures of his teachers. A trip to the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in New York forged a burning desire in him to showcase Africa's waxwork masterpieces. Now, he wants to build Africa's own Madame Tussauds from the ground up, one sculpture at a time. The South African city of Durban is known for many things. For example, it's port in the largest of sub-Saharan Africa and its beaches are beloved by tourists and residents alike. One of its sons, the artist and sculptor Lungelo Gumede, wants to carve out a very different spot on the global map for Durban. On most days, Gumede can be found in his studio, slowly molding the next likeness in his growing collection of wax statues. The first thing that you need to capture is like the whole face. Um, from, from, from the forehead to the chin, and then get the, right, get the eyes to be on the right uh, 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 place. And then once you get the eyes and then you get the face, then it's easy to actually uh, put the nose and then, and, then, and then the mouth, depending on the smile. In 2004, Gumede had the chance to visit Madame Tussauds in New York after an exhibition in which one of his paintings was featured. He returned to Durban determined to create Africa's version of the famous Wax Museum. With the income that I get from doing statues, so I'm, I'm pursuing my vision to start the Wax Museum. As you can see, I've got statues of um, political figures, I've got statues of uh, sportsmen, uh, I've got sports, statues of cultural figures. You know, I'm trying to do the same thing that I saw in the MCSO, I'm trying to do the statues of um, our icons, our heroes of struggle, you know, different, uh, in different categories. His statues of local and international public figures soon earned him fame and a living. Gumede says he has always had artistic leanings, but that the wax and clay statues he now focuses on have given him a true sense of purpose. My, my dream is about to become true. I'm about to achieve what has been my long-term goal to actually 
at the Works Museum um, to invite people to come and, 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 and experience the, the very same thing I experienced back then in 2004 when I first went to the medium to saw it to actually come up and close to, up, to come up close and personal with their um early celebrities to their uh, uh, cultural uh, leaders to their historical figures and actually you know because it's more like a learning uh, uh, a curve as well for people to actually come and learn about the history um of our country yeah so uh, it's, it's more like educational entertainment in the same place the 31-year-old is regularly commissioned by the government, private organizations and individuals to create pieces by the statues of icons like Nelson Mandela, Huma Sekela and Michael Jackson are privately funded and are being kept to eventually be exhibited in his museum. The Nukue Jazz Festival sees a musical caravan on the water bringing the sounds of jazz to the shores of Lake Nukue, one of the largest bodies of water in Benin. After a 30-year career touring the world, a Beninese musician decided to establish the festival, a musical event held in the lake villages of Benin, which often find themselves excluded from the cultural world. On the banks of Lake Nokoe lies Soava, a lakeside city located about 30 kilometers from Kotonu, Benin's state capital. Atanas Deunon is fixing his musical instruments. It is a fast on this lake built on wooden piles, where living conditions are very precarious. Nihad Sule, a student, came early on the scene. She expresses her excitement about attending her first ever jazz festival. I heard about jazz once, but it doesn't ring a bell. The Nukue Jazz Festival was introduced to villages often isolated from the cultural world by musicians from Benin, who had toured various parts of the world performing. Henri Folonier is a tourist from Switzerland. He believes that this festival has the potential to become huge. I think there's a strong potential here to bring ecotourism with the development of tourist places that will give a lot of impact to ecology and everything and to the benefit of the whole population. The Nukue Jazz Festival is mainly a caravan on the water with the sounds of music playing on Lake Nukue, one of the largest water bodies in Benin. With paddles in hand, six acrobats make pirouettes dance and jump into the water when the drummers accelerate the rhythm on the tom-toms. Jazz is a music of meeting people. It is music of mind that comes out of the heart, an improvisational music. The prerequisites are based on the traditional rhythms of our convents that we have tried to develop. Dega Aweji is a cultural actor and one of the participants. He has two of his friends accompanying him to the festival. The setting is magnificent, and so a caravan on Lake Noku, moving to the rhythm of local music. In all this, there is a link with jazz, because jazz is actually enriched by African cultures from several regions. And all this is brought back here to the origins of the rhythm and rocked by Lake Noku. It's an experience that I really appreciated and that I want to repeat. The procession on the water extends as far as the eye can see. More than a dozen motorboats take part in the festival, with about a thousand festival goers attending the event. The parade normally lasts more than three hours, during which two stops are marked to allow the locals to dance with the festival goers. Among the groups taking part in this year's festival is Wood Sound, a famous jazz group that provides shows in cabarets in upscale Kotonou. Africa is indeed a rich continent in heritage and awe-inspiring culture. On this show, we love hearing from you, so make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. From the entire team here at Africa Focus, a thank you for watching and being part of this wonderful journey. Keep it Switch TV.